Welcome to a short video overview of the Resuscitation Council's 2015 guidelines. I am Charles Deakin, Professor of Resuscitation at the University of Southampton and lead author of the pre-hospital section of the guidelines. The pre-hospital section has been revised and, and expanded and focuses on the delivery of resuscitation in the pre-hospital environment. It is aimed at all pre-hospital providers, but particularly ambulance staff, nurses and doctors. I am going to focus on several aspects of the new guidelines, but particularly the team approach, airway management, circulatory management, the use of capnography, post-resuscitation management and hospital admission and handover. The team approach is emphasised in these guidelines because the effective delivery of high quality resuscitation requires teamwork, situational awareness, leadership and decision making. In order to do this, a resuscitation team should ideally comprise four individuals who between them undertake roles as team leader, manage the airway and alternate in the delivery of chest compressions and assisting with vascular access and drug delivery. Airway management is often challenging during the management for cardiac arrest. The priority is to effectively oxygenate and ventilate the patient. And although tracheal intubation has traditionally been regarded as a gold standard, there is no evidence that outcome is improved using this technique. Simpler airway devices such as supraglottic airways, including the laryngeal mask airway and eye gel, achieve oxygenation and ventilation very rapidly and do not cause significant risk of aspiration. They often provide an ideal airway and should be used as part of a stepwise airway management pathway. Tracheal intubation should only be performed by those with adequate training and when simpler airways prove inadequate. The priorities in circulatory management involve early defibrillation and effective chest compressions. There is no evidence that a period of CPR prior to defibrillation improves success rates and solo responders arriving at a cardiac arrest should prioritise AED placement and defibrillation if indicated. With regards to chest compressions, there has been a lot of debate recently about the use of mechanical chest compression devices in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. A number of large pre-hospital studies have now been published that have failed to show any outcome benefit when using these devices. However, these devices are a reasonable alternative to high-quality manual chest compressions in situations where sustained high-quality manual chest compressions are impractical or compromise provider safety. The Resuscitation Council suggests that if an ambulance service has already purchased mechanical chest compression devices, that their use is restricted to patients requiring transfer to hospital with ongoing CPR. These guidelines also emphasise the use of capnography in the management of patients suffering a cardiac arrest. Not only is capnography of benefit in ensuring correct placement of a tracheal tube, but it is also a useful indicator of cardiac output and the effectiveness of chest compressions. Waveform capnography may indicate the return of spontaneous circulation when a sudden rise in exhaled CO2 is seen, and conversely, persistently low levels may be a useful marker of futility although utility of end tidal CO2 cutoff values during CPR to accurately predict the outcome of resuscitation is not fully established. In patients where return of spontaneous circulation is achieved, pre-hospital management may present a number of challenges. The focus of post-resuscitation management should be directed at optimising perfusion of the brain and heart. Following resuscitation, patients are usually hemodynamically unstable arrhythmogenic and hypotensive. Aim for a systolic blood pressure of greater than 90 to 100 millimetres of mercury using 250 mil boluses of normal saline, repeated as necessary. Symptomatic bradycardia in these patients should be treated with atropine according to current brady arrhythmia guidelines, but if this is ineffective, external pacing should be considered. In the event of severe hemodynamic instability, unresponsive to atropine and IV fluids, consideration should be given to supporting the circulation with 0.1 mg boluses of intravenous adrenaline titrated against blood pressure. In patients presenting with a shockable rhythm, at least 50% will have a further episode of VF or VT. Give amiodarone, 300 mg IV, after three defibrillation attempts, irrespective of whether those episodes are concurrent or separate. 
With regards to pre-hospital temperature management, no studies have demonstrated that any specific target temperature is of benefit, although it is thought that pyrexia is detrimental to neurological outcome. Passive cooling is therefore recommended for post-arrest patients. Do not cover the patient in blankets and maintain the ambulance temperature no higher than ambient. Finally, glucose management also remains important in these patients, ensuring that no patient is hypoglycemic following restoration of a spontaneous circulation. Hospital admission and handover is also discussed in the guidelines. It is important that the patient is transferred to the most appropriate hospital for their needs, and this may not always be the nearest hospital. In patients with evidence of ST elevation, transfer to a cardiac arrest centre capable of performing percutaneous coronary intervention is an optimal care pathway, and arrangements should be in place to receive these patients directly into the cath lab. In patients who are transferred to a receiving hospital, an effective hospital handover is vital to ensure that all relevant clinical information is conveyed to the hospital team and recorded appropriately. In summary, the main changes are a focus on effective teamwork in delivering a coordinated resuscitation attempt, the use of a stepwise airway management pathway in which supraglottic airways are generally sufficient to oxygenate and ventilate the patient, and in those undergoing tracheal intubation, waveform capnography is now mandatory. Mechanical chest compression devices may be appropriate where sustained high quality manual chest compressions are impractical or compromise provider safety such as during the transfer of patients to hospital. New post-resuscitation guidelines aim to optimise perfusion of the brain and heart. And finally, admission of patients to hospitals that are able to provide appropriate post-resuscitation management, including PPCI, is advised. The Full Resuscitation Council 2015 guidelines can be found on the Resuscitation Council's UK website, along with video summaries of all other sections.